Hi, I'm Scott Krieger, and uh, welcome to my moment in the sun. Today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is a part of uh, my being a pastor and what have you, because I found that over the years some people will come to a church that describes itself as being reformed, and they might ask themselves, what does this mean? Is it even significant in understanding who or uh, what a church is and what it's about? Of course, the answer to that is that is yes. Um, it is significant to the identity of a church. And you might want to understand just a little bit about what it means to be reformed. So that what's, that's what we're going to look at today. We begin with an understanding of the word reformed and where it comes from. It's taken from the time of the Reformation in the 16th uh, century, the early part of that, where Protestants broke away from the Roman Catholic Church due to the increasing excesses and corruption of theology um, that was rife during the Middle Ages. And there were many things that led up to the Reformation, events and people who were seeking uh, a, a closer return to what the Bible said about Christianity. But it really began in earnest with the Roman Catholic monk, Dr. Martin uh, Luther, when he nailed 95 discussion points, which were called theses, uh, onto the do uh, church door in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, on the 31st of October, 1517 all of which entailed points of ecclesiastical practices that Luther thought uh, were at odds were with Scripture. And that really got the ball rolling. And with it, the protestations of uh, Luther and many others spreading across Europe and Britain came to be known as the Protestant Reformation. German, Swiss, English, Dutch reformers gathered strength and over the years returned to a more orthodox view of what the Christian scriptures say in terms of their faith and their practices. Let me talk about three different things that help describe what happened during that time and what the basic points were. The first one that we want to look at is a set of what they call uh, the solas. They're, these are five important strands that were what they took a stand on before the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, these, these are Latin catchphrases that the Reformers then uh, took to task and, and brought about wide reforms within the, the ch Church. The first one is a Latin term called sola scriptura. And it means the scriptures alone. And this asserts that scripture must govern over all of church traditions and interpretations of the Bible, which are themselves held to be the subject of truth. All of our traditions and our interpretations are to be subject to scripture alone. All church traditions, creeds, and teachings must be in unity with the teachings of the Bible as the divinely inspired word of God. Now, I could give you a lot of verses that back this up from the Bible, but I, let me just give you four texts which I think are really important for us to concentrate on. The first one is from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 to 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you. And you be found a liar. Then there's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of, of one against another. Important, the important point being there to go beyond Scripture. Then there's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, which says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what 
it really is the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And then finally, we have 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The second sola was sola fide, meaning by faith alone. And this implies that God saves us by declaring... Uh, one declared as justified uh, by God, which is, in fact, of history, that it is received by the individual by faith and without the need of any works by an individual to qualify for salvation. Again, let me just pick four texts which point this out significantly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is a famous verse, John 3.16. That God loves the world, he gives his only Son, that whoever believes, and that's a belief by faith, will not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 6, verse 47 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. There you go. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16 says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by uh, works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Let me end this section with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when he, we were dead in our trespasses, makes us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Which takes us right into the next one, as kind of a lovely segue here, uh, sola gratia, which means by grace alone. So the word grace brings into this, this idea that salvation is not something that can be attained by anybody, including us, doing something to attain it. Because salvation is a free gift of God. And it is something that cannot be earned or deserved. So we have, again, four texts that I want to bring to you. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to, be, uh, right to become children of God, who were born not of, the, uh, of blood, nor by the will of the flesh, or, nor the will of man, but of God. Romans chapter 3, verses uh, 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that lovely? Romans chapter 6, verse 23, a very famous one. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And probably the most famous one that would go with this particular section is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. That's what grace is. The next one, the fourth one, has to do with what is called solus Christus, meaning by Christ alone. This means that Jesus Christ is the sole mediator between man and God. And there is no need for a priestly class 
or clergy or saints or sacraments to initiate or control that intimate communion with God. God alone is our prophet, priest, and king in Christ Jesus, in whom we place all of our hope. And so we have these four verses to show you that it comes from the Bible. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Which puts paid to the whole idea that there are other ways to get into heaven. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2 says, Therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and through him. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony of given at the proper time. The last one ties it all together, and that is sola deo gloria, which means to the glory of God. It, it, it stands in opposition to the veneration of Mary, the mother of Jesus, or to the saints that the Roman Catholic Church picked up in the hundreds, or even angels. It understands that all glory is to be due to God alone, since salvation is accomplished solely through his will and by his action. Not only the gift of all of the all-sufficient atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross, but also the very gift of faith in the atonement created in the heart of the believer by the Holy Spirit. And so the Reformers believed that human beings, even those that were uh, saints that were canonized by the Roman Catholic Church, the popes, and all of the religious ecclesiastical hierarchy, are not worthy of the glory that was accorded to them. That is, one shall not exalt such humans above, uh, you know, for their good works but rather praise and give glory to God, who is the author and the sanctifier of these people and their good works. So, again, four scriptures to be able to show you that this is based in the Bible. Isaiah, from the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 17 says, And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isaiah, again, in chapter 42, verse 8, says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat, or drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And we see how that works out at the end. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, it says, saying, uh, the saints saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. There are some other points that we want to bring to your attention in Reformed thinking. Five more important points. In response to anti-Reformed teachings of the day by a Dutch theologian named Jacobus Arminius in the early 1600s, Dutch Reformers came up with five points of repudiation that formed the basis of how Reformation churches understood the work and the salvation of God in the atonement of Jesus Christ. 
The first one was to signify the depravity, the total depravity of man. So I want you to think about the flower tulip for a moment. Imagine the, the, the word tulip, T-U-L-I-P, and remember that because we'll do an acronym here. So the T stands for total depravity of man. And that's where we're talking about the belief that all of mankind is tainted with the original sin of Adam via the federal headship of Adam. And that because of all mankind is prone to committing sin from birth, this sinful nature is innate in all of us. And thus mankind is incapable of finding or reaching out to a holy God for redemption. We are truly dead in our sins and trespasses, unable by ourselves to seek God. That's just the fact of scriptures. Let me show you again some texts from scripture. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not just some, not just a few, but all of us. Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the state that all mankind finds himself in if something isn't done to us to release us from it. The second thing of our acronym is the U of TULIP. And we it's called unconditional election. This is the idea that God has determined for himself a people that would say, uh, he would say bef from before the foundations of the world. And this group of elect people are saved unconditionally without any reference to uh, the present or the future deeds or works of such that would merit their salvation. So we have these verses from uh, John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many believers. Romans chapter 9, verses 11 to 13, though, it says, this is Paul speaking, though they were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the works, of, of works, but because of him who calls, Rebecca, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to, uh, for adoption to himself as sons 
through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Before the foundation of the world. Wow. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says, speaking of God, who saved, saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our good works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ before the ages began. Now we got to deal with that. We have been chosen and called by God unconditionally. Which then brings us to the L of TULIP, which we call limited atonement, or if you prefer to be more precise, particular atonement. This is where God has chosen from eternity those whom he will bring to himself, not based on foreseen virtue or merit or faith in these people, but rather his choice is unconditionally grounded in his mercy alone. God has chosen from eternity to extend mercy to those whom he has chosen and to withhold mercy from those he has not chosen. Those chosen receive salvation through Christ Jesus alone. So we have in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, well, he came to serve, he came to give a ransom, and to give his life. In other words, he died. John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. John 6, 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. John chapter 10 verses 11 to 15 gives us one of his famous uh, I am statements. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who uh, who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and nothing and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. John chapter 17 verse 9 puts this into perspective when he says i i am this is jesus jesus's high priestly prayer where he says i am praying for them his people i'm not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me for they are yours in other words the death of the lord jesus christ was not for everybody but for those that were his own, his own sheep, those whom he has called, those he has uh, brought about a faith. And that's something that is so irresistible that you can't turn it down. Which brings us to our next point, the I in Tulip. Irresistible grace where the saving grace of God is effectually applied to you whom he has determined to save, because you're the elect. And it overcomes your resistance to obeying the call of the gospel, bringing you to a saving faith. This means that when God sovereignly purposes to save someone, that individual certainly will be saved. The purposeful Influence of God's Holy Spirit is something that cannot be resisted, but, because, but that the Holy Spirit graciously causes the elect sinner to cooperate in, to believe and to repent, to come freely and willingly to Christ. This is not to deny the fact that the Spirit's outward call through the 
proclamation of the gospel can be and often is rejected by sinners. But rather, it, that inward call is something which cannot be rejected. John chapter 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. John 6, 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Acts chapter 13, 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. Acts chapter 16 verse 14 says, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. It's irresistible. Romans chapter 8 Verses 29 to 30 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that they might be the firstborn among many believers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The last one is one that's very comforting to me. It's the P of Tulip, Perseverance of the Saints. This asserts that since, G, since God is sovereign and his will is something that cannot be frustrated by humans or anything else, those whom God has called into communion with himself will continue in faith until the end. Those who... Uh, who apparently fall away, either never had true faith to begin with, or if they are saved, but not presently walking in the Spirit, they will be divinely chastised and will repent. Romans chapter 11, verse 29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. Then there's 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they never were with us, or not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might become plain, that, that it might become plain that they were not of us. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 to 9 says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. And whoever practices, whoever makes a practice of sinning, is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. Do you see the cause and effect of this, of becoming a Christian? Well, the five solas and the five points of the tulip are very reformed things for you to consider. There's one more thing that sets us apart, and that's a thing called covenantal theology. The covenants are important for us to consider while the above sections that we've just been talking about 
may be adopted by churches and denominations that often refer to themselves as Reformed, it only kind of goes so far as the doctrines of grace and the understanding that we have in the atonement of Christ. But the historic Reformed faith also included this understanding of God's covenanting with mankind on the conditions of the relationship between God and man, where God said these words in Leviticus 26, 12, and I will walk among you and will be your God and you will be my people. So God made a covenant with Abraham because of the faith that Abraham had displayed. And in it, he promised that Abraham would be given the promised land of Canaan. He said that his descendants would be more numerous and powerful. And that from them would come the one who would be the blessing unto the nations. You can read about these three promises in Genesis chapter 12, 15, and 17. The rest of the Bible is the fulfilling of these three promises to Abraham. Not only in prominent localized contexts, but also in the fuller and future fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven in the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. This covenant with Abraham was sealed with the rite of circumcision on the foreskin of all Israelite males and babies who were eight days old. And this was to be a perpetual command for all of Israel for all time as a reminder that God keeps his promises. And the covenant of Abraham was then later codified with God's revision, or I'm sorry, revelation to Moses in the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, and the law of God that surrounded them. Again, you can read about those in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. The law's purpose was to instruct Israel on how they should live before a holy God. Because of the sinfulness of mankind and Israel, um, God later proposed an upgrade of the covenant where he overlaid the previous covenant with Abraham, the, the same promises but where the means for employing the law of God was shifted from outward forms of the law to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in individuals who hold the same faith as Abraham. So with this new covenant, the sign of the covenant also changed from circumcision to that of water baptism performed in the well-known practices of the Mosaic law as an act of purification and cleansing. The significance of water baptism is that it remains a sign and a seal of the covenant that God made with us to keep his covenantal promises. Being reformed in your Christian faith is to take on board these things that I have mentioned in your personal life and, and lived out in your church and community. Being reformed means you are reformed and always reforming in the spirit of Christ Jesus as you are being conformed into the image of Christ. I'm Scott Krieger, and this is my moment in the sun.